Repeat after me. I bring more than diversity. I bring irreplaceable perspectives. Hey friends, my name is Whitney and I'm the host of Impostrix Podcast, the show that validates professionals of color navigating imposter syndrome and racial toxicity in their career. Join us and be validated. You got this. Welcome back to Impostrix Podcast. I'm your host, Whitney Knox Lee, and I'm here with M.A. Josian, and I'm looking forward to this conversation as usual. And let me just, before I have them introduce themselves, I have a story. <clears throat> I was thinking about starting this podcast about a year ago, and I was reading just some random stuff, articles on one of my favorite resources, which is raceequitytools.com. And one of the articles that I clicked on had something to do with basically folks of color navigating the workspace and specifically nonprofit workspaces, which was something that I was dealing with. And I was like, do I totally like I'm here. I'm this person sees me. And so then I read like about the author and this person had lived in Seattle and also had lived in Atlanta and was around my age and had a similar like journey. It was basically a reverse journey for me. And it turns out that was AJ's spouse, Nisha. And so I messaged, it was the first time I've ever done this. I've done it a lot since then though, but I messaged Nisha and I was like, um, hey, I just read your article that's like three years old at this point and I love it. We should be friends. And um, because at that point, y'all were living here. Um, and so I met up with Nisha. Nisha introduced me to their spouse. And here we are now talking with AJ. Um, I love both of them because um, I just get so much, I get so much fulfillment out of my interactions with you all. And my, like, I get a sense of community whenever I'm with y'all. So I'm really happy to have you on the show. Um, it means a lot to me. So welcome, AJ. Oh, thank you. That's such, yeah, that's such a sweet story. I love, I love the backstory. Um, yeah. And I, I know that um, Nisha, my uh, spouse was also r really excited to like get a friend on like Twitter or something like, Hey, somebody reach out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And I do agree that piece on like decolonizing nonprofits um, was really, really great. So I'm glad. And then, and then here we are now. Yes, absolutely. And so I'm going to let you introduce yourself, um, share with us who you are, what are the identities that you bring to this conversation mm -hmm. and also tell us about your podcast. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> that last one. Um, so I'm Aimee Josiane, or AJ, um, they, them pronouns. I am originally from Rwanda in East Africa, grew up in Central Africa and Zambia, um, came to the U.S. Um, as a kid, spent some time in California, now in Atlanta. Um, I say all of that because when I think about, you know, where home is, it's super complicated and I had formative experiences in so many different places, which I also think brings, um, allows me to bring um, some flexibility in my work because I work with a lot of people. Um, so I've been in Atlanta for most of my adult life with a brief detour in Seattle. And I have been um, an activist and an organizer, um, and a creative. So a lot of the work that pays me has been um, organizing with labor unions or with like a worker center. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then now I train organizers all across the country. It's um, such a blessing. I'm like, how did I get here? <laughs> I've made some good choices, I guess. Um, yes. 
Yeah. And so I do that. And then, you know, um, I do uh, some activism locally. I'm definitely still looking for that political home um, that can really hold me down in Atlanta. And yeah, and getting back into my creative pursuits. So I'm doing, I'm doing more of like the, you know, the poetry, the music that I was really into. Um, yeah, over a decade ago, I'm coming back. I'm coming back into, you know, the things that a younger version of me really um, would have appreciated more of. So it's it's been a journey. Um, and my podcast is called Disciples of Courage. Um, it is, I was actually, you know, and you know this, like just talking to you pushed me to just come back with it, you know, after a very mm -hmm. long uh, hiatus. And so I'm enjoying that. Um, you know, I think it's really a place for me to make um, connections between different um, stories and ideas in my mind and just really pulling out um, the lessons about courage you know, being a disciple is like being, you know, I'm not, I'm not Christian, but I grew up in a very, you know, religious household and being a disciple is about being like, you know, um, being like a, a follower and like a, um, you know, I think of it as like a train the trainer, right? Like, you know, Jesus tells you what's up and then you go and tell other people what's up. Um, and so I think of discipleship in that way when it comes to courage of like, when we have stories about courage, when we figure out what helps us be courageous, then we should share that with people because um, you may have the best intentions in the world, but you need the courage to actually carry things through, you know? And so like, that's to me is like the gas, you know, that you put in the tank when you're really trying to go somewhere. Um, but yeah, so making connections, you know, like finding lessons about courage in everyday stories in you know um mythologies in reality television like it's just yeah it's everywhere i really like the podcast because of the stories one of the things that um you know i'm learning about as a podcaster is including narrative including stories in my conversations even though it's a conversational podcast um where i'm where i'm having guests and so your show, one of the episodes that I listened to had a lot of stories around, I think it was mythology, not I think, it was mythology, um, but mythology from Rwanda. And for me, that was really cool because I'm not Rwandan. And so for me, it was also like a cultural lesson. Um, and then you were breaking down the seven types of courage. And that episode was about one of the specific types of courage. And I liked the idea of breaking down courage in that way, because courage is difficult. Like that's the, mm -hmm. that's the point. I don't think like, I don't know if you have courage without difficulty. I think if it's right, not, then I don't. Then you know, is it courage? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, not that it's not good or anything, but it's just the part of courage that makes it difficult is the action. And that action a lot of times in my experience isn't, something that's necessarily easy mm -hmm. maybe there's risk involved for myself or for other people um or you know maybe it just requires me going out of my comfort zone and i think as it relates to you know imposter syndrome and race the topics of this podcast so much of what we do and how we navigate work environments and career spaces but also organizing spaces um also social and political spaces Mm -hmm. has to do with having courage around our authenticity, around how we're going to show up today, around how we're going to show up in solidarity for others and whether we are going to and the way that we are going mm -hmm. to. Um, and so, yeah, I, I really, I encourage people to listen to Disciples of Courage because I think it's a good show. Thank you. And, you know, you hit on like the key, like one key word, which is risk. Um, a lot of what gets in the way of people being courageous is like that assessment of risk. And, you know, a lot of how we assess risk has to do with the bodies that we 
inhabit, you know? So I'm like, you know, black, um, you know, visibly black, like unambiguously black, <laughs> uh, you know, um, femme body, you know, non-binary, like, um, you know, for the most part, able-bodied. So like all of that, like comes into play when I'm assessing my risk um, in any given situation. Uh, and I also think that with with like any other practice, like practice makes it possible. So like if you practice taking courage in a particular area, then it'll make it easier. Like it won't stop, the risk won't go away. The fear won't go away, but like your capacity to just like move through it is what changes. And for me, um, the place where I've had the most practice, like my courage lab has been my work, um, mm. you know, cause I work in an environment that does require courage, um, and does require us to help other people access their own. And so, yeah, I think that I'm excited to talk more about, you know, labor and work because I do think that workplaces are such great, like practice labs for a lot of the ideas that we have about the world. Yeah, yeah, so let's get into that because I, so my background with labor unions is that at one of my previous legal employers, I was in a union. I was a dues paying member for like less than half the time I was at that place, a couple of years. The rest of the time I just sat and chilled and benefited from the union negotiations. So mm -hmm. like my bad. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I still have questions around like, so, so what's the big deal? Why, why unions? Um, what, what do they do for, those of us who are members or could be members of unions? Yeah, so I'll give a f maybe two responses. Um, the, the, the real like, you know, in my heart response, um, you know, I am um, a socialist and I, for that reason, I see unions as one of the most direct steps towards the kind of society that I would want to see, the, you know, the kind of like um, economic realities that I would, would want to see um, where people are able to control their labor um, mm -hmm. in some way. And, you know, maybe contrary to the current labor movement leaders, I don't think that unions are um, the end, you know, for me. Um, unions are a means to an end, and that end being, you know, a system where by people actually do own um, their labor. So, you know, you can call that a cooperative economy, you can call that a socialist economy, whatever. Um, but, you know, we need a bridge between the world that we're in right now and the world that we want to get to. And so when it comes to labor, for me, unions um, and worker centers are those bridges that allow people to really think about their labor a little bit differently. Um, and then, you know, so, so that's kind of like my philosophical, like, this is what a union means to me. Um, what, how I explain unions to people who I'm organizing with um, is that one, it provides you with um, an opportunity to come up with collective solutions and it gives you protection. And so to me, those are like the two um, maybe most like material like gains that you get from a union. But then there's a third one that's really about like the transformational nature of being in relationship with people that you work with, um, with a lot more transparency. Cause you're gonna have to talk about what you're making. You're gonna have to talk about how that impacts you. You're gonna have to talk about, you know, the uncomfortable conversation that you have with your manager about, you know, your workload or whatever. So 
there's something that happens, you know, hopefully if we, if we're doing a great campaign that people start to understand like, oh, like this really, you know, messed up experience that I had is like not just a me thing. Like it's an organizational problem and we need some ways to, to rectify it. So the, the union for me is like a place where people can come together and really decide the kind of workplace that they want. And I have never, um, I've never really been so much of an individualist kind of person. Um, so to me, it does make sense. Like, oh, if I want a promotion, like, let's all ask for it. You know, like, there's power in numbers. Like, mm-hmm. that kind of came easily to me. Um, mm-hmm. And and the way that um, the last thing I'll say about how I explain unions to folks is um, that it is your organization. Like the union is you. The union is not your organizer. Unfortunately, I think a lot of you know unions now kind of do function in that way where like just bring your problems to the organizer or to your rep and they'll take care of it, right? Um, that's not the kind of union that I want to be a part of. And so um, I am a member of a union right now, um, UAW, National Organization of Legal Service Workers. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Listen, UAW is out here just doing it, girl. Like, they're, yeah, UAW is having a very good um, uh, organizing streak right now. But, um, yeah, so I'm a part of my union. You know, I go to my union meetings. I participate. Like, I'm part of the contract negotiations. Like, you know, it's, um, I think it really is going to be what you make of it, you know, and, um And so I always, even when I was a union rep, where my primary role wasn't to organize campaigns, I still really asked people like, what are, what are like even small administrative changes that you would want in your office? And like, use that as a way to really help people understand that like, what we're trying to get is the power for you to decide. Because who decides now is just your boss. When you have the union there's there's that check. It it really alters that relationship of power. And so, you know, a question that I learned from someone who trained me around organizing was to ask people, who decides? You know, like, mm-hmm. oh, I had a, you know, like I had to do X, Y, and Z project last minute and I wasn't prepared. Who decided that? Right? Like, did you decide that? Did your boss decide that? Don't you think that you should be able to decide? a bit more about your workload. That was ooh, a lot. <laughs> I should have I should have got a pen to write because <clears throat> I I'll start with the last thing you said, which was around the decision making. And I'm thinking about my experience with unions. And I know, I mean I imagine that the folks who were active in the union are, are officers. Um, did feel as though the union provided some sort of say in decision making. But as, you know, the little person in South Georgia who, you know, barely heard from the union, that was not at all my experience of the union. Um, But also, I was not, you know, an active member of the union. And so, again, like I said earlier, unions my my history with unions has really been kind of benefiting from those material interests that you talked about um around you know specifically for me it was around pay it was you know negotiating the collective bargaining agreement um usually that was when we would get pay increases sometimes they might change the step level for promotions um but down to the day-to-day stuff you know i i i just didn't know that that was how it worked or how it can work um, mm-hmm. during a, you know, when, when there's a healthy union. And I think, you know, for folks listening who have an opportunity to be a part of a union or who are part of a union, hopefully this gives you some food for thought. Um, because for me, 
and my personal experience with unions, it's always been kind of like high level decision making is mm-hmm. what unions are for. And I know we hear a lot about UAW, for example, um, and every time you know they they're fighting for higher wages at you know car plants and stuff like that. Um, and it's so it's inspiring. You know their activism is very inspiring. But I never felt a connection to that mm, um, mm-hmm. in my, you know, in my work economy, if if you will. Um, and so I was also a member of UAW Legal Services Workers because it was a legal service organization, which is always has been just weird to me that <laughs> we are somehow cousins to auto workers. I know. Um, <laughs> but I'll take it. You know, it's fine. Um and then the other thing that you mentioned was, you know, at the outset, your your philosophical take on on why unions. And I really like that. Well, what I heard, I suppose, is the sense of ownership of the labor. And I think when when I think about liberation, that's what I think of is ownership over all things dealing with me mm-hmm. um, and that each individual, you know, has that and that we work together to keep that um, and that we are working together so that the decisions that we're making and the, you know, the life or death decisions, the am I eating today or am I not eating decisions, the healthcare decisions, the childcare decisions, all of these like big decisions are community decided and community is made up by individuals who have ownership over what they can or can't do and what they can say yes to and what they can say no to. Um, and so that really, really resonated with me and, um, you know, brings me to my next question, which is about just how, how labor unions and the civil rights movement, um, converged or did not converge because also my limited understanding of unions is that, you know, historically unions were not open to workers of color, Mm -hmm. um, and that there was quite a fight to allow people that look like us to benefit from these protections um, and not necessarily, well, I, let me say, my understanding is it's because the type of labor that we did as, as folks of color was not labor that unions were basically allowed to form. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd love to hear you know, the actual yeah yeah somebody that knows (laughs) yeah no i think you're right you know like the history it's like it's full of contradictions um yeah it's just it's full of contradictions um but they're also like you know the i think at the height of the civil rights movement there was also um a very healthy density um of unionism and so, yeah, like the history, you're absolutely right. The work that Black people did in this U.S., um, in the U.S., was stolen, right? Like, it's like the labor was stolen. It wasn't valued. It wasn't considered real work. Um, and so the labor movement for a long time was just white people because it was designed for white people. And the process to actually even be recognized as a labor union really reflected this idea that Black people are like not human and their labor is not real. Um, For a very long time, um, and there continues to be exclusions about the type of workers who can even unionize. Domestic workers and farm workers, think about it. Domestic workers work in the house, farm workers work in the field. They're excluded, right, under like, you know, national labor law from actually unionizing. So still, that, still like today, this day, wow. this day. So some some sections of some sectors of domestic work um, can unionize. And um, and there are um, some home care workers who are organized into um, a couple of unions. But, you know, by and large, um that is not permissible, right? Like, so like the the big labor law um, is kind of reflecting the ways that people felt about labor at that time. And that's the, that's the really 
unfortunate and like, you know, just terrible legacy. Um, and so, so there's that piece. And then there's also, um, you know, some other contradictions when we think about the ways that segregation was carried out. Um, and I always think of this story, um, Rosa Parks, you know, in Montgomery gets, um, you know, um, kicked off, you know, and arrested, like kicked off the bus and arrested. That bus driver is a union member, right? Mm -hmm. That bus driver's actions are protected by his union, right? Mm. And so I think that when we look back at the histories of unions and like what union members have contributed, like, yes, there is, um, there are some very like powerful stories, um, you know, like the work that A. Philip Randolph did with um, with um, sleeping car porters and really organizing them and organizing that into like a really good job, you know, relatively. Mm -hmm. So, so there's like that kind of work of like where you see, you know, the pride of being a unionist, and then there's like you know, the unionists who were like the front lines of, you know, segregation and racial violence. Um, in the integration of labor, I think, you know, is is similar to the like um, um, integration of schools. Like it brings people into more intimate relationship as peers because Black you know, white folks were always close to black people, but not as peers. So now if I'm in school right. with you, if I'm at work with you, now I got to be a peer to you. Um, and so it was very difficult, you know, and there were some unions, even in Atlanta, actually. I think there's um, at one of like the textile plants here. Um, there's a story where they um, brought some black women onto the shop floor to do, to work. Um, and the white workers walked out, walked out and went mm. strike. Said we can't work, we can't work here if there's black women. If these black women come into our workplace, it means that our workplace is going to be devalued. Mm. So we don't want to mm -hmm. be in a workplace that's going to be devalued because you brought these folks in. Um, you sound like they talking about houses. Say what? I said it sounds like they talking about houses. Right. <laughs> so. I think that there's always that tension within labor. And that was like, you know, that must have been like um, in the like 60s or something. I don't think it was too long ago. Um, so I do think that there is like this kind of rub um, between what it means to bring like all workers together and then what it means to like have a union that is kind of holding on to its white identity, this white male identity specifically. And unfortunately, you know, some of the more, um, you know, traditional, traditionally masculinized work, those unions tend to be white <laughs> and male dominated. Whereas, you know, the teachers and the flight attendants, like those are, you know, usually like women dominated. And so, so there's all of, a lot of that. Um, but I think um, where the civil rights um, movement and the labor movement came together really well, um, you know, again, back to A. Philip Randolph, who, you know, in a lot of ways did that bridging and was able to really, um, I think, like, connect this piece around, like, pride and respect and work to like just this overall theme of like dignity for black people. Mm. And, you know, under him, we got like Bayard Rustin, you know, and then we got like, you know, the MLK, you know, connecting to labor. So I think that once the connection is made, um, I think that's when we saw like the movement really grow. And I feel like we kind of need to go back to that right now. We need to go back mm. to really, um, you know, encouraging and making space for, you know, regular, regular Black people who are working to really think about their labor 
um, as something that they can leverage collectively to, to get better conditions. But yeah, I think about that. And, and then also like, you know, under a Philip Randolph or like, you know, other black unionists, um, there was a lot of like skill and intention and strategy. Um, and, you know, if, if that movement didn't exist, the March on Washington wouldn't have happened because I feel like the kind of, to me at least, right. I'm just making a bold statement, but you know, like, I think that, um, the, the discipline that comes from, from organizing and labor, um, is super necessary in order to like make those kind of large scale movement moments happen. And so there's a lot, um, there's a lot there to be proud of. And, and, you know, I think that there is something to be said about the, um, the point at which, um, Martin Luther King Jr., who, you know, is not perfect, but the point at which, you know, he became the most dangerous, I think is when, you know, he was actually, um, being a lot more visible and supporting unionist um, and also supporting anti-war activists. So um, I do think that the idea of Black people becoming unionized in mass is dangerous to um, the society. And that's why we need to be doing it more, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, always, always, wherever Black people gather. You know? Absolutely. And especially Black people gathering and getting a sense of feeling a sense of ownership of their labor, as much labor as Black people are out here, you know, doing. I mean, mm-hmm. it's totally dangerous. So so I think that there is that. And um, and then there's also been, you know, um, some other, you know, going back to the people who have been excluded from unionizing domestic workers. There's, there have been so many incredible um um, labor projects by Black domestic workers. In fact, one of the um, pivotal moments in that movement was in the late 1800s um, where uh, washerwomen in Atlanta um, were trying to get some sort of intervention from the city council around um, their pay. Um, and they had a very successful strike. And it was part of a sweep of strikes. Now imagine, you know, slavery has been legislated out just a few years. And Black women are going on strike and changing what the Atlanta City Council is doing. So in some ways... And talk about courage. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but just talking about courage and and risk. Absolutely. You know, like I, I couldn't imagine. Like, and, and these white people are probably like, look, like literally two days ago, you were my property. Right. And now you think you use somebody. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And I think, and that's why it's so dangerous. You know, mm-hmm. that's why it's so dangerous. Like, how dare you have, you know, um, a sense that you're worth something, right? That you're worth mm-hmm. everything. Like, how dare you? And so I do think it's really bold. And there's there are a lot of these like bold examples of people coming together around their labor, even if it's not a union, which is why I say that, you know, to me, unions are a a means to an end, you know, it's great, super if you have one, and having one doesn't um, equal that liberation that we are all kind of moving towards. And then the last thing I want to say, too, is... um, I think the ways in which we think about labor organizing, um, by and large, like the story of of labor organizing, I think is really told from a white perspective. I think if we tell Mm. the story of labor organizing in the US by black people, we would start in 1861, Mm. right? We would start by really going back and recognizing that you know, the work stoppages, the sabotaging, the raids, you know, everything that made um, the slavery economy unmanageable for all these years and that forced the North to actually take a position on slavery, like, that was labor. Wow. And um, W.E.B. Du Bois calls it, I think, the great strike. 
that period, you know, that Lincoln didn't free the slaves, the slaves stopped working, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, there yeah. was a work stoppage. The, the relationships of labor had a shift, maybe not as much, where sharecropping was then instituted. Right. But it did have to shift. And so I really love, when I do trainings on like the union, oh, on the, sorry, on the history of labor organizing, that's where I start. Um, because I think if you understand that and you understand the power of collectivized um, Black labor, but also the power of collectivized Black labor with other working people, too. Yeah. And I just want to comment for a moment that that's a great example of bringing anti-racism into your work um, and into the legacy of what you do. Because as you said, you know, labor is told from the perspective of whiteness. Um, and so many of our stories, so many, so much of our history is told through that, that lens. And I think a lot of times as a consultant, you know, we get questions about, well, what do you mean? Like anti rate being anti-racist in, in this way or in our work, or as we're talking to people or, you know, give me a specific example. So for people who are listening and are like, and something's clicking for you. Like, this is a great way of just acknowledging. So going deeper than what we know. Um, because we know that our country is built off slave labor. Um, yet we don't talk about that labor whenever we're talking about how great the United States is and how, you know, our economy and being a world power and the building up of cities and all of this stuff. Um, and so fill in the gaps, you know, do the education and then pass that on. And so I love that you brought that example of like, no, we started 1861 and we talk about, you know, this, this massive strike of enslaved people and the labor. Um, so we have to wrap up here in a second. I want to ask about um, the work that you do also with queer communities. Um, because I know that you you were telling me you recently wrote an op-ed um, about about organizing um, and, and queer communities and kind of inclusivity. Um, so can you talk about that? Because I'll say some of what I hear you saying around the way that labor unions have, you know, hold contradiction and in some cases, you know, not in some cases, were created um, at the exclusion of people of color, it reminds me of the law and the contradiction that I feel that I hold as a practicing attorney. Um, and so I just wonder, you know, how, how you help those of us who are in marginalized communities, whether that's by race or queerness um, or disability, navigate like this contradiction. Mm. Hmm. Um, and maybe how do you navigate it? Yeah. So one thing that I kind of hold as a North Star um, when I'm thinking about the kind of organizations that I want to be part of or work for um the kind of workplaces that I imagine to be dignified, um, my measure is could a woman who is black, trans, and not English as um, her first language, like could that person come in this, in this workplace and have one access, does she have access mm. to this workplace? Can she come here and be comfortable? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to, you know, oh, and and she's disabled too, right? Like, I think that you, um, where we often miss the mark as a movement is to not really think about, um, yeah, to not really think about access and um, about, in general, like disability justice and um, and gender justice. And so I like to 
bring that into the work that I do. Um, you know, I'm on a board for a Black Worker Center and from for an LGBTQ Worker Center. So, and I see them both as doing, you know, the same work <laughs> essentially of trying to like, you know, um, create a space for workers who aren't otherwise organized. Um, and in both spaces, I find myself really pushing and being pushed by my peers around disability justice. Um, because when we think about the ways that um, labor laws function right now, if you are, um, you know, the, the whole marriage equality thing, yeah, gays can get married, shit, I got gay married before it was federally <laughs> recognized, just so y'all know, okay, head of the game. But, um, but yeah, and it's kind of like, yes, it's great that people can get gay married, but if you are a person with a disability and you're receiving, you know, um, money for that, you can't get married because that threatens your benefits. And so right. people are still excluded from marriage. And I think that when we kind of, um, you know, focus on like the folks who are able to be the most successful when a lot changes, um, we kind of allow ourselves to be like, um, I guess, I don't know, just like full, then we get away from like the real purpose, which is like, you know, gay marriage, let's be honest, it does not help, you know, a woman who is black, trans, disabled, immigrant, like, um, it may not make a material difference, you know, in her life. And mm. so I think um, what I am really excited about is the ways in which um, both in um, queer and trans labor spaces, there is a an increasing amount of leadership around bringing disability justice into the work and also being very clear that Black people are like at maybe at the highest rate of becoming disabled. Like, you know, being Black in America is disabling. Being a Black oh, worker in America is wow. disabling. So like it is a reality that at some point we are all going to have to face as workers. Um, and that doesn't change, you know, because you make a lot of money, um, like work is disabling. <laughs> and so I'm really excited by the leadership of people who are kind of moving in the labor movement with that sort of like idea in mind. Um, so yeah, the national black worker center, um, have been doing some great work in creating also a Black Worker Bill of Rights, um, trying to, you know, create campaigns through which people can actually, you know, um, institute some of the, the rights that um, we believe all Black people deserve, including uh, really like all Black people, right? Like we, we're not doing this, you know, some of us are good, some of us are whatever, like all Black people um, people who are incarcerated are having their labor stolen. How are we thinking mm. about that, you know, as being part of our movement? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of like, I think that where I'm, where I think I have been super blessed in my experience in this movement is that I've been doing the labor organizing, but doing it from a place of being rooted and grounded in queer, trans, and Black community. And so I, I don't know, I just feel so blessed that I get to have yeah. perspective and I'm not just like, let me just go and start a union and blah, blah, you know, but I'm like, no, like, how does this tie into my liberation as a full human? Right. It means something different with the perspective. Um, and I'm really glad that you shared that perspective with us today because you said a whole word at that at the end. I might have to name the episode. Um, black, what what was it? Being black, working while black is disabling, or something mm -hmm. of that nature. Yeah, it's yeah. But okay, can you share with us one? Share with us your your mantra okay. or your affirmation for this time, and then share with us where we can find you if folks want to listen to the podcast. Okay, so this is um, an affirmation that I wrote yesterday. Uh, during therapy. <laughs> and okay. it reads, um, I lead with what I want. I deserve to get it. I believe I will get it. 
Mm. I love it. Thank you. And where, where can we find you? You can find me on Instagram um, at Disciples of Courage. Um, I think, yeah, it's just at Disciples of Courage. If that doesn't come up, just add a podcast to it. And then um, my personal Instagram is at Rowan Delicious. Um, I don't post a lot, but it's a very pretty Instagram because I get it's my creative space. Um, and yeah, and then you can also stream Disciples of Courage on Spotify, Google Podcasts, really wherever you find your podcasts. Awesome. Thank you so much, AJ, for joining us. I also just have to know, AJ is wearing a shirt that has knives on it. I just feel like somebody's going to have watched this whole thing and been like, Whitney didn't say anything about that shirt. So it's an amazing shirt and it has knives. Thank you. All right, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Until next time. Thank you. Bye.